Um, so what I want to talk about is um, something that uh, has plagued me and concerned me for a long time now, which I guess one technical term for it is gradualism. Um, how, how much worse things have gotten very slowly. And, um, and I think it's really true in, um, in the privacy security area. It's true in a lot of places that have to do with technology because people are, um, normal people are a little intimidated by it and they don't, they don't know enough to know what they should be watching out for. So I found this, I, I know before anybody corrects me that the frog in the water thing has been disproved. Nobody has ever done that. It's not a real thing, but it's a great analogy, so I'm using it anyhow. Um, okay, so um, this talk is, um, n you know, n nominally about gradualism. Um, we'll see. Um, so the, one of the things that, that, that came to mind when I was starting to put this together um, was a, a book that was very um, important to me um, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when um, I started working in the digital media space. Um, and the, uh, how many of you have read this book? Excellent. So this, this um, is Neil Postman's uh, meditation on a comparison between Orwell and, and Huxley. And um, his conclusion, or what he proposes is that Huxley was right. So I was poking around online, what the, what, one of the things I was trying to do in this sort of gradualism vein was to see um, how bad was it and how bad has it gotten and have peop, you know, what have people kind of come to believe about this. So um, I found this amazing uh, 1987 BBC series called Secret Society and there's, um, in it, it, you should watch it. It's like, well, for one thing, the clothes are hilarious, but, um, but it's kind of remarkable. Um, so this reporter um, was doing this expose. It's called, this, the second series, the episode was called We're All Data Now. L little did they know. Um, so uh, he um, got, there was a computer, you know, with, with, you know, it was a CRT that was like five miles long, deep. Um, and they looked up, they were looking up people's names, like off the street. And we want to show you, you know, see what's, what is available to the public about you. And um, so they brought these, they brought people in. And um, I really wish I could show you the video because it, it was amazing. But this was... Um, I don't know, for some reason, this one amused me more than anything. So the, these, these data came from um, voter rolls. So this is, I guess, where it started in the UK, was that um, these councils would, you know, what we'd call them boroughs or cities or whatever, would sell their voter rolls to whoever wanted them and didn't tell anybody about it, but they just did it. So he looks up this guy, Walter Smith, this was the sum total of what was online about Walter Smith and his wife, Edith. You should have seen the guy's face. He's like, oh, this is quite distressing. <laughs> and, um, you know, there were people were very um, adamant about how they felt about it. So um, what do you think of government selling the voter rolls? Huge majority against it. Um, do you approve of um, this information being sold to national data banks? Even more, no, 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 no. And uh, this was a column that I wrote in, um, in 1989 in San Francisco um, about this new breed of entrepreneur um, who's like getting access to all of this information and selling it. Uh, whether you like it or not, and I actually cut out the quote in there about it was it was a, a consultant who was on CompuServe, <laughs> which half of you probably don't even know what that is, but it was very old, old, old online service. So I thought, wow, okay. 
Um, and so then I just thought, well, okay, I'm going to look up Walter Smith now. And he would have a heart attack if he saw all this stuff now. I mean, this, this, um, I think this is people search or something like that. I mean, it just, you it just piles up all this stuff. I mean, it's, you know, credit card, um, court records, addresses, property records, uh, criminal records, it, you know, some of them even give social security numbers, as you know. So it's, I mean, it's really a big change just for like less than 30 years. That's a lot of data. So that's, you know, the People are, and I, I, I didn't include this because it was, there's already too much text on these slides, but the Pew, um, Pew Internet uh, people did a report on privacy and, and um, the numbers were actually lower than in the, um, in the poll, the Gallup poll that the BBC took for things not like, you know, I mean, everybody's, you know, their information is sold now. Nobody even thinks about that being a problem, but the percentages are, are even less, like 61% or something, people said, you know, um, it should, it should, there should be a law against someone falsifying your records or something like that. It's, you know, I mean, frog in the pot. Um, so um, I, I just thought it would be fun to, to look at um, some of the comparisons um, between Orwell and Huxley based on some of the stuff that I have found around. Um, so Orwell thought we were gonna be deprived of information and Huxley feared that, that we'd have so much that we would just be floundering around in our own juices, not able to do anything about it. And this is a um, headline from last December that I called everything that's wrong with the world on one screen. And what do you do when you read something like that? It's like, oh my God, I'm gonna go back to bed. Um, and Orwell thought that the truth would be concealed. Huxley said, no, it's just gonna get drowned. And this is, you know, a Google News page. Weather, sports scores, comets did not bring water to Earth. Home Depot, I mean, it's just, it's too much. And Orwell also said we would be captive, but Huxley said we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies. I mean, who cares? It's sort of like this. <laughs> and the other thing that Huxley said was that people would come to love their oppression and things that would, the technologies that would undo their capacities to think. Uh, you know, this is, I pulled this off of the um, iTunes App Store today. Um, positions for the last four hours. Um, for pretty much anyone, apparently, whose phone number you have. Um, which is followed by this really creepy but true situation and it just seems like people don't really put those things together and then in terms of undoing our capacities to think I you know I this may be a little bit controversial here but um I feel like Google has um although I use it four billion times a day it's really kind of flattened information um I notice uh, here I, one of the courses that I, that I teach has to do with research methods. And if it's not on Google Scholar, nobody looks anywhere else. Um, I couldn't find a number to, to, to um, show how many journals are not online versus how many are, but there's a ton of information that will, you know, will never make it to Google because it'll be, it would just be too hard to get it there, but it's, it's stuff that's part of our scientific and cultural record. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me about this was um, back in the day, back in the day when I, um, I used to be on this TV show called The Site, 
that should date it for you right there. MSNBC did this thing about the, you know, it's this show about the internet. And um, a guy that I knew for, you know, years and years, he had been part of the programming technology, cypherpunk, everything kind of community in San Francisco forever, said, you know, th this is evil. You know, people don't have any idea what goes on underneath that. How are they going to figure out how to find stuff if they don't know what's, what's, in, what's involved in doing that kind of a search? And I thought, oh, for God's sake. But, you know, and it's the same kind of complaint that, you know, people who are um, very, very nerdy in the computer sense can be very prejudiced against Macintosh because it hides the complexity. And, um, you know, I feel that. I, you, you know, I, I don't know that I would advocate, you know, having to teach everybody how to program. But I will say this, being in this room for this week with all of these amazing women who know how to program is kind of a life-changing thing. Um, it would be a good thing for people to know how to program. So on um, undoing our capacity to think, this is another one that I think is really interesting. You know, this might be an ev this all might be evolution stuff. I don't know. So maybe we're evolving out of our ability to you know hunt and find, and what we're doing instead is fi you know figuring out how to you know look for things on the horizon. But this is interesting that it's that comprehension is different when you read on paper better than when you, than you, when you read on screen. And the other um, recent story that um, was interesting to me along those lines was that um, when you write notes with, by hand, you remember them more than if you take notes on your computer, which explains a lot about why I can't remember anything. Um, so, all of this, I feel like, you know, there's just been this gradual, nobody really asks the hard questions. If you do ask the hard questions, um, you're a Luddite, which I find really offensive because I am so not a Luddite. But I really also think that these are legitimate questions to be asking. Are we um, amusing ourselves to death, basically, with all of this stuff? And um, I, uh, I told these guys when, I, um, when we started on Monday that I was going to call my talk, I blame television, because I do kind of blame television for everything. Um, and I don't think I'm really terribly wrong about that, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, one of the things that's really interesting to me about, about TV is that if you look at anything that has to do with privacy, um, from a, not, ju not even just from a government perspective. If you watch the most popular show on television, NCIS, every episode, Tim's hacking into some database or another or, you know, cloning your phone or what, I mean, it's, there's no, it's just become part of the air that we breathe that we assume that a, this is possible, B, that it will be done, and there's no hoopla about it. And you say, well, it's just TV, but you know, TV is an extremely influential medium. And as you know, that's kind of obvious, but it, it changes the way people think about things. So I have thought for a long time that it would be really fun and impossible to find out who actually advises all these TV shows? And my personal belief is that there's like, you know, for the CIA, for example, I mean, come on. So we have 1971, you know, huge uproar about the CIA and, you know, conducting these operations and nobody knows and it's terrible. We hated the CIA, right? But not now we got Annie. And, you know, you have to think what, you know, like what happens when people watch this? It's like, oh, CIA is not so bad. She's cute. And she runs fast and she knows how to fight. It's great. I really wanted to show the um, opening sequence on a show called Person of Interest. Does anybody watch that? Has anybody seen that? Oh, my God, it's so paranoid. Um, 
it's about a guy who builds this machine that sees everything. So it's tapped into all the cameras, it's tapped into all the phones, it's tapped into everything, and it tracks you, it can track individuals down to that level. And I just keep thinking, wow. It, I, maybe after we're done, if we still have time, I'll, I'll, I'll play it for you. I have, it, I have it on YouTube here, it's amazing. So um, the other book that has really um, been really important to me um, along these lines, and it's, it's a nice fit with, um, with Amusing Ourselves to Death, is this book, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. Have anybody, has anybody read that? Yay, thank you. Um, I got interested in this book in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when I um, was, uh, when I had started a newsletter called Digital Media, and the associated conference was called Digital World, and it was basically before anybody knew what was going on at all. So people would come together from all these different industries, and they would try to figure out um, how they were going to do business in this new digital environment. Um, and what it ended up being was the great, there's a great um, illustration in one of my Times columns about all these like old white farts sitting at around a table and they all had like octopus heads and all their tentacles were in each other's pockets, which was basically how the, how the business turned out. Um, but it was, um, I, th I, I had read this book and I thought, you know, interactive media is like television on steroids. And if we're going to be inventing this new medium, should we think about what, um, what this one has been and done? And um, so his four arguments are, um, to why you should eliminate television is, um, see if I can remember these, one is uh, the mediation of experience, that everything, th that, you, that humans don't have direct experiences with things, that there's, a, um, that you see a television screen and you see the frame and you don't know what's going on outside the frame. Um, then there's the colonization of experience, which has to do with, um, advertising and how um, products become more alive kind of than people do. And then the third one is, well, the fourth one is the biases of TV, the, bi the inherent biases. And the third one is um, how television changes us physically, how we interact with things physically. Um, but I thought it would be very interesting to just, you know, I bought about you know, a dozen of these books and I seeded all these kind of industry people um, to try to have a conversation about this. And it was very interesting to me because they were all, they were like angry about it. How dare you question this dominant medium? And, um, I, you know, I thought that what Jerry Mander, which is his real name, um, what, what he had to say about this was very interesting. And I think that, you know, uh, th this, it's at the end of the book, and he said, you know, the question he always got asked by everybody was, well, okay, we don't like television that much either, but th it's impossible to eliminate it. And so he, and it was an interesting meditation for me to think about what kind of filter would you have to put on issues around technology to be able to change something that's so deeply entrenched. And I thought it was really um, interesting. He, he really based it in democracy and, um, and, it, and looking to see you know, what kinds of technologies actually subvert democracy. And um, so that center paragraph kind of goes back to what I, was, what I said about Google. You know, if, if it's too complex for a normal person to, figure out how to either dismantle it or in the case of privacy, you know, figure out how to not get tracked, then there is no democratic control. So um, I just think these things are important to think about and um, I don't see how we get our 
how we get our hands underneath this stuff um, unless we think about things like really out of the box. So um, thank you. That's it.